grateful to uh, have the chance uh, to speak uh, at this uh, workshop. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so uh, the way uh, we talked about um, looking at uh, CDOC CRM today is that uh, there's more and more interest in using CDOC CRM in European projects. Uh, and uh, oop, great. Um, and then uh, when you get down to it, you actually have to put it into practice. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's where you hit on to uh, problems of implementation, problems of interpretation, problems of uh, understanding. Uh, so as I understand it, the core idea of this workshop today is to uh, really look at uh, CDOC CRM in a hands-on way uh, and try to understand uh, what it's for, but more particularly look at, uh, already knowing that, uh, look at particularly difficult modeling issues uh, in a um, live environment and work together to uh, solve issues such as that. Um, so what I plan to do for my talk this morning uh, is actually just to go back to uh, basic CDOC CRM and look at the top parts of the model uh, and uh, what that looks like because I think our conversations uh, in the afternoon in the more workshoppy se setting uh, will always refer back uh, to these basics of CDOC CRM. So I hope that uh, that is um, useful and uh, doesn't repeat too many things you know. Uh, if uh, you want to stop me to talk about this, that, or the other thing, it's fine by me, so just uh, raise your hand. Um, so the content of this talk uh, will have three parts. I want to start with uh, a quick reiteration of uh, why uh, CDOC CRM and why a formal ontology. Uh, then I want to look at uh, the CDOC CRM idea itself. Uh, and then we'll just take time and look at different parts of uh, the model and uh, how they're formulated and what they're used for. So the problem statement uh, is uh, how to manage information diversity. Uh, oftentimes I have a really long uh, intro on this topic, uh, but I thought I'd chop it down. Um, so to work by analogy. <laughs> Uh, left to our natural devices, uh, if we uh, follow uh, our interests uh, in theology, uh, we might come up with many different gods. Uh, they have many different powers. Uh, they uh, meet very many different needs. If you think about, uh, if you want to think about metadata more dramatically, <laughs> um, Metadata, uh, people come to uh, formulate metadata standards for different needs uh, in, in accordance with different software they might have to use. Uh, and all of these uh, formats uh, serve a certain need just as many different gods serve different needs. Um, but we're all talking about the same world and we want to bring that information together. Um, so we have to find a, a means to do so. Carrying on with my theological metaphor, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, interesting idea of uh, unity comes about. There can only be one. Uh, so a notion that uh, in the face of a plurality of metadata standards in a certain domain, uh, what we should do uh, in face of that is to impose one standard that's bigger and better than the other ones. Uh, Sounds like a good idea at the time, uh, but it leads to uh, the fall, uh, which is that uh, bringing up a new metadata standard that will cover uh, all of the things uh, that you were trying to talk about before inevitably is just creating yet another data standard. So something else, another uh, addition to the multiplicity, uh, which we have to cover. So we end up in an endless cycle of trying to come up with the one and best standard by which to describe things, and uh, create data. So uh, what we need is another strategy. Uh, and uh, this is Dr. Esperanto himself. Uh, so we need some idea of uh, mediating uh, between metadata standards. So the point isn't to uh, replace uh, the many data standards with one data standard, but to come up with some sort of interligua that allows a re-expression of existing data into a common format that allows those uh, 
existing formats to continue to exist and fulfill the purpose and function that they're made for in a software, in an institution, or what have you, and yet be able to share uh, data into a larger pool. Um, so that makes my introduction on the problem much shorter, which is excellent. So CDOC CRM uh, is uh, such an attempt. CDOC CRM uh, is, uh, for the historical information, developed by the CRM uh, Special Interest Group. Uh, the Spear CRM Special Interest Group uh, is a member of the International Council of Museums through the International Council of Documentation, uh, whose acronym is CDOC, uh, because it's the French version of International Council of Documentation. Um, the standard has been developed since about 1996. Uh, it was launched uh, because around 1996, uh, the International Council of Museums and the uh, International Council of Documentation had been trying to build one common uh, metadata standard for all museum data. They had developed a very large uh, relational database that nobody could use. So they abandoned the project. Uh, and at that time, formal ontology was coming onto the scene uh, as a new methodology for trying to solve uh, information management problems. Uh, and so they adopted that, and uh, the start of CDOC CRM uh, was initiated. Um, so that work uh, is done by uh, an uh, inter interdisciplinary team uh, of museum professionals, of uh, computer scientists, and of academics. Uh, it uh, has resulted in the CDOC CRM, uh, which was uh, recognized first as an ISO standard in 2006, uh, and then that process uh, has to be renewed uh, continuously, so we just did a renewal in 2014. Um, the standard itself comes out of this dialogue between the members of the SIG, uh, and so it's not a top-down approach, but we have uh, this exchange from different scholars, from different perspectives, uh, and the resulting concepts and relations are tested by uh, this group of specialists from different points of view. Uh, and what it's developed is a generic model for recording what has happened in a historical way on a human scale, uh, which uh, enables huge networks of uh, semantic knowledge. Um, some background data about the CRM SIG itself. Uh, it uh, meets uh, three or four times a year. Uh, it's open for anybody who wants to come and uh, present projects or participate uh, in developing the standard. Uh, it usually circulates around Europe uh, and oftentimes in Crete. Um, and um, you can contact, uh, so in continuation of our discussion uh, today, uh, in addition to being able to contact me, uh, you can contact the CDOC CRM SIG uh, through its mailing list uh, if you have either challenges to the way the ontology uh, is structured or questions about how to use it uh, or anything in between, uh, then you can uh, get into that discussion list and people will engage with you. Um, so that's that. About uh, the CDOC CRM goals, uh, so I mentioned, I gave the background very quickly of the theological presentation of metadata. Um, so the, the goal of CDOC CRM is to be a, a sort of interlingua. Uh, and the interlingua, uh, the argument would be uh, that your different databases and metadata forms uh, create uh, propositional statements uh, about the world as such. And when we're talking uh, from within the same domain, such as uh, humanities and historical-based studies, then even though each of these different data structures uh, slightly differently formats the data and therefore slightly differ differently uh, gives us a an angle onto the world, ultimately uh, they're trying to make propositions about the same world and there is a way to translate those propositions into a similar digital format. That's uh, what the CDOC CRM uh, wants to be, uh, the similar digital format. Uh, not to be the base format, to, but to be the translation format between these different forms. Um, it wants to support high-level uh, information recall. Uh, so 
if you have this lofty goal of being the translation format between many different types of metadata formats within a, a field, uh, then the way you're going to achieve that is to find generalizations uh, in the information structures that are applicable regardless of what angle you're taking uh, on the data. So this high-level information recall is to say that we want to build classes and relations uh, that will grab uh, large amounts of information regardless of what its uh, detailed uh, information structure is. And if we get that, then we enable access to the information regardless of the granularity. And if we keep, uh, if we keep our reference to where the original data came from, then you can always find the data in its original format uh, and find the specific uh, information uh, that you're looking for if CDOC CRM somehow doesn't capture that. Um, another principle that we have in creating it is monotonic extensibility. Uh, so people who come to uh, CDOC CRM uh, for the first time uh, might oftentimes say, uh, I look at it and it seems very general uh, and uh, I need many things that aren't in here, uh, so why can't I go ahead and create uh, many new classes and relations that will cover my field? The answer is you can and you should, um, if that's uh, what you need to do. Uh, but in terms of the standard, uh, what we want uh, is to create, whenever we add something uh, to the standard, we want to be completely sure that that class and that relation uh, is a uh, robust class and relation that we've understood and if we keep using it through time we won't have a fundamental reevaluation of what it means because if we have that since we're a standard it means that if people have if if we came up with a class I don't know called office holding uh, and we hadn't understood what office holding was and we gave a bad definition then there could be hundreds of data sets using office holding in one direction and then at a certain point we realized we defined it poorly uh, at which point we have to redefine it and then we would have nullified all of the instances that had used the previous definition and we would have violated our monotonic extensibility goal. And the last thing to say is uh, that the way that we build the model uh, is bottom up instead of top down. Uh, so when we introduce new classes and new relations to the model, uh, the idea is that we go out there and we get data structures uh, that we want to cover uh, with the standard. Then uh, you have to find uh, the information in a data structure and say, this is something that people are talking about in humanities, in history or what have you. It isn't ac adequately covered by the CRM. And that's the evidence for trying to build new classes or relations. So we don't start with uh, a certain uh, causal theory or something and build our classes downwards. We build it always on demand based on what people are actually recording. So, um, could I get some water? <laughs> um, if we reach our goals, uh, this is the picture uh, that we uh, want to enable. So. Specialists um, and uh, researchers and uh, professionals uh, will work in their own local data structures using whatever metadata format, whatever database structures uh, that they're interested in using that are precise and adequate to their needs. Under the circumstance where they want to collaborate uh, with uh, another individual or institution, uh, where they need to share information into a larger pool and they can't adopt the same uh, database uh, or metadata standard, then they can adopt CDOC CRM. They take uh, their data structures and they map them to the high level uh, classes and relations that are defined in CDOC CRM. They can further refine uh, that information using thesauri that specialize the classes and relations of CDOC CRM, which are very general, uh, also creating standardized content. Uh, and then they translate the information held in these databases via those categories into a semantic uh, network structure here, uh, where the collective information from the multiple sources uh, can be queried uh, and 
where you retain uh, the reference to the original source so you could go back and find uh, the data in the original structure if that is relevant. Mm. And we would see in a very general way that that uh, semantic process uh, should happen uh, in uh, this, this. This is a block of a, a larger semantic process we could talk about. But if you just want to talk about mapping, uh, then what you first need to do in a semantic project uh, is to define uh, that you have some common research goals uh, that you want to uh, meet via bringing your data together in a semantic network. Um, identify the sources you want to use. Um, then uh, export that data into a format that you can use uh, in a mapping tool. And I think today we'll look at Karma. I'm not sure. Maybe? OK, anyhow. OK, anyhow, there are two. The, the two mapping tools that I know and or would recommend uh, are uh, 3M or Karma. So if you want to talk about those at any point, we can. Uh, you need to get your data out and do some cleaning if it's in a, if it's in a bad state. You need to learn the ontology uh, that you want to map to. Uh, and all this section ideally can be done by a researcher or a digital humanities specialist. Create a mapping between your original sources uh, and the ontology. Uh, in 3M, that would create X3ML mapping files. Uh, then in 3M, we have a, a generator process, so it's a, a place to define how to uh, build your URIs uh, and connect your data together, run transforms, and explore the harmonized data. In the way that we look at the semantic process at Forth, uh, we separate out this generator's uh, step, and we would say that a, an information specialist should do that and not a uh, researcher. Um, Okay, so if there are no questions on that, um, I plan to spend the rest of my time uh, just looking at the model itself uh, and uh, the, its different parts. So just to take a step back, uh, CDOC CRM is supposed to be a top-level ontology. It presently has uh, over 90 classes, I think it's approaching 100, and about 150 plus relations. It's in its sixth version, um, and it has eight harmonized extensions. Uh, the idea of a harmonized extension uh, is interesting uh, because it's not uh, so often done. So what we mean by harmonized extension is that uh, we have the base ontology here, uh, and uh, it should give you the basic classes and relations you need for describing things at a historical level, so events, actors that participated in events, objects that were created or destroyed by de events, um, these sorts of things. But after that, you would often need much more specific information structures uh, to accurately document uh, what you want to represent. Uh, at that point, we work together with uh, specialists uh, in a field uh, who want to create CDOC CRM compatible uh, a CDOC CRM compatible um, conceptual model. And first of all, they create a conceptual model vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their own data. And then we work on the harmonization process, which is to link it up uh, to CDOC CRM and make it uh, intellectually compatible. Uh, so it's not the process of ontology where uh, you choose this, that, and the other class from some ontology because uh, it has the same name as the thing you want to describe. Uh, but here we have high-level concepts that specifically describe uh, certain, uh, uh, certain entities in the world and how they interrelate. And when we go down into uh, more specific information structures, we make sure that we're coherent with that vision up there. So um, I will just s skip to the next slide uh, to show that. So the current uh, eight official extensions are FRBROO, uh, which is uh, something created 
together with IFLA, which is a standards body uh, for uh, library studies. Uh, and it takes the model uh, FRBR, which is a model for describing uh, all bibliographic information, and it uh, makes it semantic. In fact, we're in the process of, they created a new model called LRM, uh, which is, uh, and we're in the process of making that compatible with CRM. Press OO uh, is a continuation of FRBR, and it's for documenting serials, uh, so not so relevant. CRM INF uh, is a extension that looks at argumentation. Uh, so the idea is to uh, encode uh, instances of argumentation, which we describe as observation, inference, or uh, uh, belief adoption. And so you can actually uh, try to describe uh, the argumentation processes uh, and how they relate to data within uh, the semantic structure. So you can do, you can, you can, you don't model, uh, mm, you model the form of the argument, the historical form of the argument. So you can recall uh, why this, uh, why this conclusion was came to based on what premises in reference to actual triples within your, your data. Uh, there's CRM Psi, uh, which is um, used for documenting analytic uh, uh, scientific processes, so measurement making, sample taking, measurement making, observations, uh, so documenting that laboratory observation process uh, and the steps within. CRM DIG uh, is for documenting digitization processes and it, generally if you need to describe anything digital <laughs> then you uh, should go in that direction. So if you want to be modeling uh, files and uh, processes of working on files uh, then CRM DIG is your, uh, your option. Uh, CRM Archeo has been uh, developed with uh, the archaeological community uh, and it's a generalization over documentation practices uh, of field excavation, so it should provi provide general uh, classes and relations for documenting uh, or for bringing together documentation from field excavation, even from different methodologies. CRMBA is kind of an extension of uh, CRM Archeo, uh, and it's for building archaeology, so it's looking for stratigraphy uh, in uh, buildings uh, and uh, how that explains uh, change over time. And CRM Geo is an extension uh, that makes uh, uh, CRM uh, base compatible uh, with the OGC standards uh, for uh, geoinformation science. Uh, I just want to go back one step and say, and go back to the idea of high information recall. Uh, so as we develop these very specific, so obviously I said, I mean, there's 100 classes and 150 relations here. And then as you imagine, uh, the list of those things makes the classes and relations that exist within the CRM world quite large in number. You adopt, in order to be CRM comp compatible, you always have to adopt CRM base, and then you adopt the extensions that you would need to cover uh, the information you're looking at modeling. Uh, and the interesting thing about this harmonized process is that no matter how far you go down uh, in the classes and relations, they're always referred back into uh, the highest level concepts, which means that uh, you can search up here at the level of event and say, bring me back uh, all events that occurred at such and such a time, uh, and it will bring back instances of observation, instances of digitization, instances of uh, place, uh, place measurement, uh, and so on and so forth. So you get a very robust uh, level of information recall, even if you use very specific level categories. Um, so, uh, generally, <laughs> when I'm introducing CDOC CRM, um, I'm introducing it to uh, people who don't know it so well, and I understand you guys know it better than most. Um, and the, the one thing that I'm always trying to uh, uh, speak to is if it's too complicated or if it's too big. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the presentation is somewhat formatted around that. Um, but broken into uh, color codes, uh, this is the CDOC CRM hierarchy. 
And since the, uh, uh, since the presentation will henceforth be uh, color coded, I'll give the colors. So uh, blue things will be temporal entities, pink things are actors, brown things are uh, physical things, yellow things are conceptual things, and green things are places. Uh, and what I'd like to do in this presentation is make that look not too messy. Um, so the basic uh, thing that we uh, return to in teaching CDOC CRM is that it's an event-oriented uh, model uh, and that regardless of where you are in uh, the model of hundreds of classes and relations or its many extensions, uh, the basic modeling pattern remains the same. We have the notion that uh, data gathers around temporal entities. So when we look at objects, when we think of ideas, when we look at actors, uh, we're always referring back to events. So uh, we, if we say an actor uh, was born in, or an actor in 1929, uh, we want to refer to the fact that they were born in 1929. And we want to, so we want to look at the event of the birth and we want to look at the circumstances that were surrounded. So where it happened, uh, who else was involved, uh, what ideas came out of it, or what have you. So at the center of the modeling is always a temporal entity. Uh, in temporal entities, actors can participate. So actors are, uh, are entities that have agency, uh, that can take decisions, that have a causal influence uh, on uh, what will occur. Uh, Two temporal entity, temporal entity is the only entity to which we ascribe time. So unlike uh, in many documentation systems where you immediately shortcut to it's a vase uh, and it's 1400 to 1500, we say it's a vase, it's a physical object, and it was evolved in the event of its production, uh, which happened at 1400. Um, so that's a very fundamental principle. You can talk about temporal entities that are occurring at places. Um, and then we talk about the fact that temporal entities uh, affect or involve uh, physical things or ideas. And the idea is uh, that they can either bring them into existence, they can take them out of existence, or they can uh, fundamentally modify them. Uh, and then the broader principles are that uh, Anything in the CDOC CRM world uh, can get a name, a very fundamental human uh, activity. So everything can get a name or many names, and anything can be typed. Uh, so it can have one type. We're out constantly classifying things, and we can classify them in many ways. So all of these entities can be multiply named and multiply typed. Mm. Which leads us to the basic CDOC CRM sentence. Um, so in the center, we have CRM entity, which is any uh, thing in the world of discourse. So for example, this mug. Um, and then we can give it a name, George's mug. Mm, we can type it. We'll call it a mug. Until uh, now, we just knew that it was a thing. Uh, and then if we have uh, no other way of storing information, we can use the has note property of CDOC CRM, which is George's prefers, prefers others not to use his mug. Uh, so that's a very basic uh, CDOC CRM example. Mm. So to use CDOC CRM and to think about CDOC CRM, I suggest uh, breaking it down into uh, its overall component pieces and understanding the top level of the hierarchy because everything else just follows from the logic at the top. And in fact, ironically enough, I mean, it's the, the top level is the most general abstraction, so it's harder to understand than the lower level categories, which become more and more tangible uh, and uh, obvious, hopefully. So at the very top of the CDOC CRM hier hierarchy, we make these distinctions between temporal entities, persistent items, and places. Uh, temporal entity also has uh, the, uh, is often called a perdurant in philosophy. So it means that it's the kind of thing uh, that is not whole at any one moment in time, 
but its completeness is the completeness of, uh, of its uh, temporal range. So a wedding, for example, if, the, if, you, stop, if you arrive at the wedding uh, halfway through or at any point within it, that's not the wedding. The wedding is from start to finish, from, you know, whenever, I don't know, whenever the, we'd have to define when a wedding starts and weddings end, but in any case, uh, the, com the entirety of the wedding is the one temporal entity uh, and then its parts are the different temporal constituents. Whereas we have persistent items, which are also known in philosophy as endurance, uh, which are things that at any moment in time uh, have their complete identity. If we freeze time, uh, then they continue to be exactly what they are. So I'm an endurant, you're an endurant, bottles are endurance, uh, even conceptual things uh, like the text of uh, Shakespeare's, uh, a Shakespearean text would be an endurant. Uh, and then we have place, uh, which in CDOC CRM is entirely unromantic, and it just means a geometric feature uh, that we can uh, locate things at, and nothing more. No, no feelings, no moods, uh, nothing of that sort. And that's an interesting point, actually, because we could argue about it later on. But the point isn't for us, CDOC CRM isn't trying to define how reality is it's making functional concepts that you can use to build information around. So it's not necessarily the case that place as such is what CDOC CRM defines it as, but we define CDOC, we define place as a geometric space so that you can use it functionally within an information system. So if you have research that's on place in a much more interesting sense, uh, then it doesn't mean that you would map to E50, E53 place or argue about that it would mean that you would have to find what's really expressed by your notion of place, which is obviously not geometry. Um, so then, <laughs> for the <laughs> uh, I have this uh, little illustration of the battle of the stick people uh, to give the idea of temporal entities and persistent items. So the whole battle uh, is uh, indeed the temporal entity. Uh, the persistent items are the two people which, uh, even though they get bigger and smaller or what have you, retain one separate identity. There are definitely two of them, and one's on the left and one's on the right. The swords, the triangle, and the sun. And the place would be the geometric extent of this uh, epic battle between the stick people. <laughs> so, any questions before I go on? Because I can just go on and on. I will go on and on. Uh, so, those are the top three things you need to know. So, if you're thinking about mapping or modeling, is the thing I'm looking at a temporal entity? Is it a persistent item? Is it a place? That's, a, that's the root of, of problems to think about. Then, obviously, uh, we need to know much more than that. So, let's look at uh, the top level of temporal entities. Top level of temp temporal entities looks a bit like this. And again, uh, it may or may not look daunting to you, depending on your love of graphs and diagrams. Uh, but let's say that it does look slightly daunting uh, and you want to know how to cut it down. That's what I'm interested in telling you about. Uh, so I argue that that uh, entire chain uh, can basically be explained uh, by these top level classes. So, um, and I think the easiest way to talk about them uh, is to go directly to this slide. So, CDOT CRM uh, is not just, uh, or is, is not even primarily about classes, but it's about uh, relations. The classes allow you to express relations, uh, and the relations are what makes information interesting. Uh, so, when we're in the temporal entity structure, um, the first relation that we get that's allowed by the temporal entity unit is has time span. So, if what you're looking at documenting is something that ha has time span, then probably what you're talking about is a temporal entity. Um, the next uh, category down uh, is period, uh, and period begins to allow you to say more. So you. Because it's the ontology, of course, whatever you can say about a top-level entity, you can say about whatever is underneath it. So, period has time span. It also has the properties of took place at uh, and consists of. So, 
period is used uh, when we have a level of knowledge where uh, we don't know uh, who's involved, uh, we don't know um, what things are involved, but we want to talk about uh, a general era. So this could be both, uh, could be ancient, could be uh, Jurassic, but could also be historical, uh, it could be uh, late Minoan three or what have you, where all we want to specify is the extent over which uh, a temporal entity took place uh, and uh, the time it took place and potentially to break it up into parts. So this P9 property consists of, uh, is the part of property uh, for periods. So it means that you can say that Minoan consists of early, late, and early, middle, and late, and early, middle, and late consist of LM3 and LM3B and da da da. Um, then when we go further down the chain, uh, we get to event. Uh, at the level of event, we're now talking about agency, so we can talk about people participating in an event, and we can talk about uh, what um, objects or concepts uh, were present in the event. So again, we can say that it has time, we can say where it took place, and now we can talk about uh, who was involved uh, and what was involved. Um, but we're not at the level of knowledge where, where we can or want to assign uh, causal agency. So we just say that this is a happening. Uh, we know that something occurred. So it could be the wedding and we just want to say there were these people here uh, and there were those items. And we don't want to talk about the fact that it was Bob and Mary that got married or, or what have you. So that's that. Uh, then we get down to uh, the level of agency um, where, okay, it's not here. Anyhow, there is a sub property of had participant, which is uh, uh, P14 carried out by. Uh, and there we simply say that this activity uh, was caused by these groups of actors. So this specializes event and gets you into the entire realm of any intentional act. So if that's archaeological excavation, or if it's assigning numbers, or if it's doing measurements, doing observation, anything that is carried out by human beings and you want to model as an E7 activity or below. And then we have beginnings of existences and endings of existences. Uh, and those two have the properties of beginning of existence takes a persistent item or puts a a persistent, persistent item into existence, and the end of existence takes it out. So, pretty simple stuff, hopefully. Um, and it begins to explain, so everything we looked at is up to here, and then everything that chains down underneath uh, this level of the hierarchy is just iterations more specifically about different classes of items. So if we have creation, creation is the bringing into existence of a conceptual object. Formation is the bringing into existence of a group. Birth is the bringing into existence of a, a person. And transformation is the taking out of existence, well, it's more complicated, but taking out of existence of one thing uh, and by destroying it, bringing something else into existence. We also have production, which is the bringing into existence of a physical thing and type creation, which is creating uh, a new category. Um, and we have the classes of ceasing to be, which uh, are similar. So dissolution is uh, uh, the end of a group. Death is the end of a person. Destruction is end of a thing. And transformation is uh, end of a thing, start of a new thing. And then, uh, I don't want to get into all the sub-details of this, but I just wanted to point out what I said before, that you have, uh, when you get down to, a, if you want to model anything that's about human intentional activities, then you start with E7 activity, and you can find many different assortments of uh, classes that cover very specific types of activities, like acquiring uh, objects, or curating them, or giving them uh, an identifier. Um, and then 
something that's very relevant uh, to uh, modeling uh, with these time categories is to make statements about uh, the time span that they occupy. Uh, so when we want to state a time in CRM, we always go through the temporal entity, we use has time span, and then the time span we define as either usually ongoing throughout or at some time within. Uh, and these indicate different levels of certainty uh, with regards to uh, the time that this temporal event took. So if we say, um, if we have some event uh, and it has some point here where we know it's not happening uh, and some point here where we also know where it's not happening and then somewhere in here it's really happening and in between it's fuzzy and difficult to say. Well, if you say at some time within, then you say that uh, I don't know when it starts or stops, but somewhere farther outside of that, it's definitely within those bounds. So you're safe. If you really know that this thing is ongoing at some point, then you say ongoing throughout, and then you say throughout this span that I give you, the thing is definitely occurring. Uh, you also have the options to say uh, had at least and most duration if you don't have if you don't know the actual start and end points, then you can just give, it took six months, it took three months, or what have you. Those are some basic statements you can say about the time span. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I was just trying to think of uh, a good example of this uh, intensity question. So, uh, depending on your definition of party or what have you, uh, so, if you had the party advertisement that things were from 11 p.m. till dawn, uh, then you could say that it's at some time within 10.30 and whenever dawn happens uh, in your present location. That would be the idea of at some time within, whereas the idea of uh, definitely, what's, what's the actual term? Uh, ongoing throughout. The idea of ongoing throughout might be some more uh, 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 thick definition of the party. So. When, when the music was really happening between, I don't know, 12.30 and uh, 2, uh, then it was definitely ongoing throughout. Uh, I have plenty of time. Uh, and then, uh, so the idea is, uh, and the idea that I'm trying to communicate uh, for my time here is that uh, you need to look at the top level model, um, and I'll share these slides. Uh, and understand those basic relations that the, the top of the hierarchy gives you, uh, and then you use them in a relationship to these patterns, and uh, patterns like these are, are published on our website uh, for trying to document different types uh, of situation. So I just put one up at random. We have the idea of influence. Uh, so you can say, uh, we can talk about uh, purposes uh, and uh, intentions of activity. So an activity had the purpose to support some other event. You can say that uh, a production made an object uh, that would be used, what was intended to be used in an event, and this is a, a super property of that relation. You can talk about an activity being influenced by anything at all, uh, so by a painting, by a person, or what have you. You can talk about it more strongly as being motivated by, so it was, it was directly uh, caused to happen because of that thing. And you can talk about sequences of activities, so you can talk about uh, this activity, some painting activity, takes up an earlier painting activity. So when learning and trying to model with CDOC CRM, I suggest having the top level model and then looking at these different patterns or creating your own patterns uh, to try and uh, model what you want to model. So next I want to look at place. Uh, place is rather simple actually. Uh, so place allows us to localize uh, an event or say where an object is right now and it has uh, four basic relations which are all self relations so you can either say that some place overlaps another place that it has a border with another place 
that it falls within another place, which is, uh, which is a part of relation. And I think consists of, we actually eliminated. So yeah, yeah, that says P89 twice. So you can either say overlaps, borders with, or falls within. Um, but with that, you can talk about where, uh, uh, where a period happened. You can talk about, uh, there's this class moves, and you can talk about moving some object from one place to another place. So the move moves this object from that place to that place. You can talk about physical things having a former or current location, so where they're actually located at. Uh, and uh, normally it's important in modeling your place, you'll have a bunch of different appellations uh, for the place. So that could be, um, could just be a name in the classic sense of appellation, so uh, shelf number 53, uh, but it's often things like uh, the actual coordinates uh, or uh, an address. Uh, and so those are uh, special names uh, that you would want to usually model your place with. Um, then I want to get into uh, the complication of persistent items. So this is the complete collection of things that are underneath a uh, persistent item. Uh, and at the top here we have a uh, thing. Uh, and uh, then on this side we have material stuff. And this side we have conceptual stuff. And again, it looks like quite a thicket of information. Uh, and I want to break it down into smaller chunks. Uh, so this top level actually has an interesting uh, and originally baffling looking structure that has, uh, a, a, has a, a logic. So the persistent item uh, is again this idea of an endurant uh, and it's that it's something that will be uh, static through time as long as it, it exists. Um, we have underneath persistent item thing and actor. An actor uh, has, is, is, uh, has this quality of being persistent through time but it has the additional characteristic of being causal, of being able to be an agent. So it's under persistent item, but it's not a thing. So it's a typical Kantian philosophy. We don't treat other human beings as things. Uh, they're uh, ends in themselves. So that's why we have that complication there. Then we have thing, uh, and thing breaks down not immediately into conceptual items and physical things, but into man-made things and legal objects. Uh, and there's a logic between, behind that. So on the one hand, man-made things, all conceptual objects are man-made things. So uh, we, that's a useful higher category for conceptual objects. But not all things, obviously, are man-made objects. So we have man-made thing, all conceptual objects are man-made things. And some portion of physical things are man-made things. So that's that complication. And then on this side, we have legal object. So uh, all physical things in our legal system can become something you can own. So they're legal objects. But uh, amongst the conceptual class of things, ideas themselves, uh, before they're expressed in some format, before they're in a document or what have you, can't be owned. Uh, so not, conceptual objects aren't legal objects. So it's only when you get down to the level of symbolic object that you can own an idea. So that's why we have that triangle there. And then we have uh, conceptual objects uh, which are uh, the product of human imagination. Uh, and they're anything that was brought into existence by conversation, thought, or what have you. And we can refer to uh, again over time. They continue to exist so long as somebody or something carries that information. Uh, and they can be multiple. So once I think up the idea of Hamlet, uh, Hamlet is in my mind and I share it with you. It's in your mind. Uh, there can be another instance on a piece of paper, on a napkin or what have you. So Hamlet can be multiple instantiated. 
and it will continue to exist as long as there's the piece of paper or a napkin or me remembering it and it ceases to exist uh, when all objects or memories that carry it are destroyed. A physical thing is something that's brought into existence through some physical or uh, man-made process. It's one and unique uh, and it has a material substance and when it's destroyed, it's destroyed for good. So, um, here is the top level of uh, persistent item and its relations. So, what's interesting to say about them? All persistent items can be involved in events. Um, afterwards, anything uh, can have a dimension. So that means to say that, because thing is this higher level class and conceptual objects are underneath uh, thing and physical things are underneath thing, it means thing, a, a, a thought as much as a physical thing can be measured, measured in different ways. So conceptual objects would probably be measured in terms of number of syllables or what have you. Um, we have this property of shows features of, so you can say of anything uh, that it resembles something else in some way. Um, when we go down to legal objects, that's where we get the property that it can be subject to some right. So here we're in the ownership questions, and it, that right can be held by some individual. Um, then if we go down to physical thing, uh, the most salient properties are the part of property which is composed of, so we can say infinitely that an object is made up of a smaller object is made up of a smaller object and we want to talk about its material consistency so uh, it's made of gold, it's made of silver or what have you. Those are the properties there. Um, then what else? When we talk about man-made things we go back to this notion of uh, well naming is important so it has a special appellation, what is its title, what is the specific title that was given to it by an artist or by a curator. And then we have the idea of intentionality, so what is the thing meant for. Um, and if we're talking about physical things, we might want to document what state we find it in uh, now or in the past. So we have this notion of uh, has a condition state. Um, and so, within conceptual object, sorry, I know that this is like a, a very like long litany of uh, <laughs> the class and relations of CDOC theorem. What I, I mean, if I, when I normally do this, I might take uh, four hours, then we would stop and like do exercises or what have you. But since I have an hour and I figure I want this to be the background for and reference material for actually working hands-on together in the afternoon, so I hope it becomes a valuable subject of conversation between us later on and not just me propounding classes and relations at you. Um, but I think these are, I mean, this top level, those things like why is there man-made object there? Why is there legal object there? Uh, they're important to understand about the model uh, so that you uh, can use those fine distinctions uh, which might otherwise not be apparent just by reading the specification. So with that as an apology for the, <laughs> what, the rest of what follows. Um, uh, so this top level here is also interesting. So underneath conceptual objects. So we have persistent item, these things that last through time and have one identity. We have actors, we have physical things, and we have conceptual objects. Conceptual objects are birthed of our minds. Uh, they're these only created by human beings and uh, objects of discourse. What's interesting about the breakdown? Yes. May I ask a question? Please. As for the um, differences or as for the separation, distinction between conceptual and physical things, how do you? I, I'm sure there is plenty of examples where it would be very hard to was thinking of an example, where would you put the movie, for example? Is a movie a physical thing, like a role, where it would be printed up on it, or is it a conceptual thing? Both. 
<laughs> so you need to be able to model. Uh, you need to be able to model both at once. So I'll just uh, skip ahead here and uh, talk about that. So let's talk about this in relationship to the movie. Uh, so the movie would have been uh, imagine uh, whatever. The, the, the conceptual object at some point would have been Jurassic Park. So they're talking about making Jurassic Park back and forth, blah, blah, blah. So there's the idea of the, the film project Jurassic Park. Uh, then at some point they actually, you know, write the screenplay, uh, the gate, get things down. Uh, so as, and then you have the idea of propositional objects and symbolic objects. The propositional object is statements about the world. And a uh, symbolic object is the uh, code that you would put that in. So English, French, mathematics, what have you. So, and the information object is some propositional uh, content encoded some way. So the screenplay, in fact, is an information object. Uh, it's the information object that gives the information about how to execute Jurassic Park, um, which will eventually be put into the movie. So then if they went and so you could have an information object has type screenplay Jurassic Park and that would be one way of modeling uh, Jurassic Park. But you're saying, well, now they've produced Jurassic Park and they produced it on cellulose because it was still that's the way it was back then. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, eventually they'll film it, they'll cut it all together and you you end up with a cut. Yeah. It's the final, it's the, the original cut. So the original cut would be the product of some creation activity, a long extended, you could model it very, with many parts, but you basically have an E65 creation, which is making Jurassic Park, and its end result is the information object, uh, which we see, uh, which is encoded, uh, I mean, which is all, which it takes the instructions and now has all the images and what have you in the particular sequence. So it has information, is information object, has type, the film. Uh, and then for the actual object, so let's say it's, you know, it's first cut onto that one reel. That's, that would be the physical reel thing, uh, which I keep in storage in the archive. And it has its own special value, so I document it and I look after it specially. But I want to have these two different ways of modeling it and a way to relate them because I also want to say, I might want to, I'm, I'm doing Jurassic Park research and I'm interested in knowing how Jurassic Park spread across the world and informed our culture. So I want to be able to mark when this information object entered different spheres. And I'm not interested in tracing the movement of the, this physical thing. I'm interested, interested in finding instances of this information object being repeated in different theaters around the world, for example. Um, so that, that healthily helps me talk about, uh, <laughs> conceptual objects. Mm. So yeah, just to reiterate, conceptual object, uh, itself has no, uh, uh, fixed content, whereas propositional object, you're already starting to make real statements about the world. Symbolic object would be characters by which you instantiate your thoughts. And the information object is almost 99% of the time what you'd actually document with, because if you're working with historical sources, what you're looking at would be an encoded text. I mean, it's somebody wrote something down and you're looking at what they're trying to say, the propositional content via the characters they wrote on the page, the symbolic object. Um, oops. And uh, so what else is interesting to talk about there? That's it. Uh, any symbolic object can be carried by a physical thing. Um, there's different part of com composition between symbolic objects. So letters are made of letters, not ideas. And propositional objects. So Hamlet is made up of the idea of tragedy and so on and so forth is different than the letters within it. Um, propositional objects can refer to uh, the world um, and why is it not showing up? Oh, there it is. And another interesting thing is that uh, type is a conceptual object in CDOC CRM. 
So type is the class for categories. So for every category we come up with. Um, so you might think well, that's not an individual object. It's uh, a universal. But the actual idea of the type is thought up at a certain time by a certain scholar or group of scholars. So we treat it as, as a historical object. I'm running out of time, yes. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. The uh, symbolic object that is carried by a digital or digital uh, carrier, is it still? The, so the, uh, what you'll end up with, for the, we treat the actual digital object uh, as an information object. So it's a specialization of information object. And then, but eventually, digital objects, just like anything else, have to be carried by a physical carrier. So in, the, in that case, the physical carrier would be the hard drive. And it gets more complicated when you're dealing with your clouds or what have you, but <laughs> we can discuss that. Um, so I want to, I'm running out of time, so I just want to end with something not random. Uh, well, I just want to be complete, so I might as well just tell you the, this uh, last part about uh, physical things which people also find confusing and I understand many of you are archaeologists uh, and so it's a useful thing to talk about. So we have a uh, physical thing and then we have a lot of subcategories which confuse people about why there are different types of physical thing. So what we have in this branch is a certain triad that rep repeats itself. So we have the notion of thing and at the level of thing, we don't know, we're not sure yet whether or not it's a discrete object like the chair or that podium or my bottle, or if it's an undiscrete object like the side of the bottle or this side of the chair or what have you. So that's the difference between the feature and the object. Uh, so we have physical objects which are discrete, whole things that you can pick up and move around or eat. Uh, and you have uh, physical features, which are some fiat portion uh, of that object, both of which are things that you want to talk about, uh, about the physical world and especially in archaeology. So that's why we have physical thing, where if I don't know, then I can just talk about a thing. If I do know that I'm talking about a distinct object, then I say physical object, and if I know I'm talking about its part or a feature, I say E26. Then we have that triad just repeats itself. So we have physical man-made thing, and it just means it's a thing, but it was made by somebody, but I don't know if it's an object or a feature. And then you have the idea of man-made object, which is both distinct and made by a person, or a man-made feature, which is a fiat object, uh, which is made by a person. Um, and don't have sight there, which is unfortunate. And then this gives, uh, this gives an idea of how conceptual objects uh, and physical objects come together. Uh, so we have the notion of a physical thing uh, can carry an information object. So that would be like a manuscript carrying the text, or it could be a painting carrying uh, the image. Uh, and those uh, conceptual objects make reference to things in the world. They can depict things in the world with certain modes of depiction. Um, and so, yes, we use the same structure for either talking about text uh, or image at different levels of analysis. Um, that being said, um, it's 10.30, so I have many, many things I could say more. Um, but...